Hello and welcome to Guided English Courses. My name is Adam and I am an English tutor in Baku, Azerbaijan. Today we're going to be focusing on the IELTS academic reading. Specifically, our text comes from the Cambridge English Practice Books, IELTS book number 9. We're going to be focusing on Test 1, Section 1, the passage about William Henry Perkin. After I read the passage, I'm going to go over questions 1 through 13. If you would like to jump straight to the questions, you can skip to about eight and a half minutes. Let's get to it. Reading passage one. You should spend about 20 minutes on questions one through 13, which are based on reading passage one below. William Henry Perkin, the man who invented synthetic dyes. William Henry Perkin was born on March 12th 1838 in London, England. As a boy, Perkin's curiosity prompted early interests in the arts, sciences, photography, and engineering. But it was a chance stumbling upon a run-down yet functional laboratory in his late grandfather's home that solidified the young man's enthusiasm for chemistry. As a student at the City of London School, Perkin became immersed in the study of chemistry. His talent and devotion to the subject were perceived by his teacher, Thomas Hall, who encouraged him to attend a series of lectures given by the eminent scientist Michael Faraday at the Royal Institution. Those speeches fired the young chemist's enthusiasm further and he later went on to attend the Royal College of Chemistry, which he succeeded in entering in 1853 at the age of 15. At the time of Perkins' enrollment, the Royal College of Chemistry was headed by the noted German chemist August Wilhelm Hoffmann. Perkins' scientific gift soon caught Hoffman's attention and within two years he became Hoffman's youngest assistant. Not long after that, Perkin made the scientific breakthrough that would bring him both fame and fortune. At the time, quinine was the only viable medical treatment for malaria. The drug is derived from the bark of the cinchona tree native to South America, and by 1856, demand for the drug was surpassing the available supply. Thus, when Hoffman made some passing comments about the desirability of a synthetic substitute for quinine, it was unsurprising that his star pupil was moved to take up the challenge. During his vacation in 1856, Perkins spent his time in the laboratory on the top floor of his family house. He was attempting to manufacture quinine from aniline, an inexpensive and readily available coal tar waste product. Despite his best efforts, however, he did not end up with quinine. Instead, he produced a mysterious dark sludge. Luckily, Perkins' scientific training and nature prompted him to investigate the substance further. Incorporating potassium dichromate and alcohol into aniline at various stages of the experimental process, he finally produced a deep purple solution. And proving the truth of the famous scientist Louis Pasteur's words, chance favors only the prepared mind, Perkins saw the potential of his unexpected find. Historically, textile dyes were made from such natural sources as plants and animal excretions. Some of these, such as the glandular mucus of snails, were difficult to obtain and outrageously expensive. Indeed, the purple color extracted from a snail was once so costly that in society at the time only the rich could afford it. Further, natural dyes tended to be muddy in hue and fade quickly. 
It was against this backdrop that Perkins' discovery was made. Perkins quickly grasped that his purple solution could be used to color fabric, thus making it the world's first synthetic dye. Realizing the importance of this breakthrough, he lost no time in patenting it. But perhaps the most fascinating of all Perkins' reactions to his find was his nearly instant recognition that the new dye had commercial possibility. Perkin originally named his dye Tyrian Purple, but it later became commonly known as Mauve, from the French for the plant used to make the color violet. He asked advice of Scottish dye works owner Robert Puller, who assured him that manufacturing the dye would be well worth it if the color remained fast, that is, would not fade and the cost was relatively low. So over the fierce objections of his mentor Hoffman, he left college to give birth to the modern chemical industry. With the help of his father and brother, Perkins set up a factory not far from London. Utilizing the cheap and plentiful coal tar that was an almost unlimited byproduct of London's gas street lighting, the dye works began producing the world's first synthetically dyed material in 1857. The company received a commercial boost from the Empress Eugenie of France when she decided a new color flattered her. Very soon mauve was the necessary shade for all the fashionable ladies in that country. Not to be outdone, England's Queen Victoria also appeared in public wearing a mauve gown, thus making it all the rage in England as well. The dye was bold and fast, and the public clamored for more. Perkin went back to the drawing board. Although Perkin's fame was achieved and fortune assured by his first discovery, the chemist continued his research. Among other dyes he developed and introduced were aniline red, 1859, and aniline black, 1863, and in the late 1860s, Perkins Green. It is important to note that Perkins synthetic dye discoveries had outcomes far beyond the merely decorative. The dyes also became vital to medical research in many ways. For instance, they were used to stain previously invisible microbes and bacteria, allowing researchers to identify such bacilli as tuberculosis, cholera, and anthrax. Artificial dyes continue to play a crucial role today, and in what would have been particularly pleasing to Perkin, their current use is in the search for a vaccine against malaria. Now let's take a look at the questions, questions 1 through 13 for this passage. Questions 1 to 7 are the true, false, not given questions. Here are the instructions. Do the following statements agree with the information given in reading passage 1? In boxes 1 to 7 on your answer sheet write true if the statement agrees with the information, false if the statement contradicts the information, or not given if this there is no information on this. Now remember, if something is true, right, it has to be in the passage, explicitly stated there. If something is false, something in the passage has to contradict the information that is given. And if something's not given, then there is no information about this in the passage. All right, now let's take a look at question one. Michael Faraday was the first person to recognize Perkins' ability as a student of chemistry. To help us answer this, we might like to rephrase the statement in the form of a question. Was Michael Faraday the first person to recognize Perkins' ability as a student of chemistry? Okay. 
Now that we rephrased it as a question, let's take a look at where the answer might be found in the passage. I remember Michael Faraday's name coming up only once. Right here in the second paragraph. Let's read the entire sentence. His talent and devotion to the subject were perceived by his teacher, Thomas Hall, who encouraged him to attend a series of lectures given by the eminent scientist Michael Faraday at the Royal Institution. So here we are told that Thomas Hall, who was Perkins' teacher, perceived his talent and devotion to the subject of chemistry, and then later encouraged him to attend a series of lectures given by a scientist, Michael Faraday. So, no, Michael Faraday was not the first person to perceive Perkins' ability. It was Thomas Hall. Coming back to our question, we know that one is false. Michael Faraday was not the first person to recognize Perkins' ability as a student of chemistry. Now let's take a look at question two. Michael Faraday suggested Perkins should enroll in the Royal College of Chemistry. Great, we just saw Michael Faraday's name, so this should make it the job a little easier. Let's read back from the top sentence that we read earlier. His talent and devotion to the subject were perceived by his teacher, Thomas Hall, who encouraged him to attend a series of lectures given by the eminent scientist Michael Faraday at the Royal Institution. Those speeches fired the young chemist's enthusiasm further, and he later went to attend the Royal College of Chemistry, which he succeeded in entering in 1853 at the age of 15. So yes, we do know that Michael Faraday gave certain speeches, and we do know that Perkin did attend the Royal College of Chemistry. But as far as whether Michael Faraday gave Perkin explicit suggestion to attend the Royal College of Chemistry is not something we can get from this text. It's not given. So going back to our question, as to whether Michael Faraday suggested Perkins should enroll in the Royal College of Chemistry, our answer is not given. He might have spoken to him after a lecture and told him that he should enroll in the Royal College of Chemistry, but that, based on the information given in our passage, we cannot determine that. Now let's move on to question number three. Perkin employed August Wilhelm Hoffman as his assistant. So, Rephrasing it as a question, we could ask, did Perkin employ August Wilhelm Hoffman as his assistant? Let's take a look at the passage to see if it could help us. I remember something about assisting and Hoffman in the third paragraph. Here, let's read this part. At the time of Perkin's enrollment, the Royal College of Chemistry was headed by the noted German chemist August Wilhelm Hoffman. Perkins' scientific gift soon caught Hoffman's attention, and within two years, he became Hoffman's youngest assistant. So here the passage tells us that the opposite is true. Perkins did not hire Hoffman as his assistant. Rather, Hoffman had Perkins as his assistant. So, coming back to the question, we know that three is false. Perkin did not employ August Hoffman as his assistant. It was the opposite. Hoffman employed Perkin as his assistant. As a matter of fact, his youngest assistant. Now let's take a look at question four. Perkin was still young when he made discovery that made him rich and famous. Again, let's try to rephrase this. Was Perkin still young when he made the discovery that made him rich and famous? To answer that, let's take a look at when the passage tells us Perkin made his breakthrough that made him rich and famous. And the passage, the specific line to that is here. Not too long after that, Perkin made the scientific breakthrough that would bring him both fame and fortune. Well, now we're forced to ask, not too long after what? Okay. The last reference to his age that we're given is up here. 
at the age of 15. He enrolled into college at the age of 15. Within two years, he became the assistant, and not too long after that, um, he, he made the scientific breakthrough that would bring him both fame and fortune. So no matter how you count it up, he was still pretty young when he made his fame and fortune. 15 plus 2 is 17, and not too long, let's say 5 years or 10 years, that's still young. So going back to our question, the answer is true. Perkin was still young when he made the discovery that made him rich and famous. Moving on to question number five. The tree from which quinine is derived grow only in South America. The key word here is only. That's something we have to look out for when we look in the passage. Now looking at the passage, I remember the tree being talked about in paragraph four up here. The drug is derived from a bark of a cinchona tree native to South America. And by 1856, the demand for the drug was surpassing the available supply. So here we see that, yes, it might be native to South America, but it says absolutely nothing about it being only in South America. So going back to our question, <clears throat> we could see that number five is not given. We're only told that it's native to South America. Nothing about it only being grown in South America. Now let's take a look at question six. Perkin hoped to manufacture a drug from a coal tar waste product. Taking a look at the passage, I can recall that there was something about him wanting to manufacture a drug in the fifth paragraph right here. And sure enough, here is the sentence that we were looking for. He was attempting to manufacture quinine from aniline, an inexpensive and readily available coal tar waste product. There it is in black and white, exactly what we were looking for. So coming back to our question, we know that six is true. Perkin did hope to manufacture a drug from a coal tar waste product. And the last of these seven questions, Perkin was inspired by the discoveries of the famous scientist Louis Pasteur. Let's take a look at the passage. Louis Pasteur's name comes up only once in the passage, right here towards the end of paragraph 5. Right below the sentence, we are told that he had an unexpected result from one of his experiments, and the sentence follows saying, and proving the truth of the famous scientist Louis Pasteur's words, chance favors only the prepared mind, Perkins saw the potential of his unexpected find. So Louis Pasteur is quoted here, but nothing about him inspiring Perkin. This is just the author bringing in an outside quote. So the answer to number seven is not given. Perkin might have been inspired by the discoveries of the famous scientist Louis Pasteur, but as far as what we are given in the passage, we cannot come to that conclusion. We are only told about a quote by Louis Pasteur. Let's go to questions 8 to 13 now. Let's read the main instructions first. Answer the questions below. Choose no more than two words from the passage for each answer. All right, now let's jump to question eight. Before Perkins' discovery, with what group in society was the color purple associated? Let's jump to the passage to answer our question. The answer is on page two in the first paragraph. Indeed, the purple color extracted from a snail was once so costly that in society at the time only the rich could afford it. Our answer? The rich. Number nine. What potential did Perkin immediately understand that his new dye had? The answer to this is also on the second page, just in the second paragraph. This whole paragraph talks about what Perkin realized about his discovery. 
but the particular sentence that will help us out is towards the end. But perhaps the most fascinating of all Perkins' reactions to his find was his nearly instant recognition that the new dye had commercial possibilities. So our answer to number 9, commercial possibilities. Number 10, what was the name finally used to refer to the first color Perkin invented? Again, the answer is on the second page, just in the beginning of the third paragraph. Perkin originally named his dye Tyrian Purple, but it later became commonly known as Mauve. So our answer to number 10 is Mauve. Looking at question 11 now, what was the name of the person Perkin consulted before setting up his own dye works? The answer is again on the second page, in the third paragraph, just ahead of the previous answer we found. He asked advice of Scottish Dye Works owner Robert Puller. So the answer to number 11 is Robert Puller. Question number 12. In what country did Perkins newly invented color first become fashionable? Once again we're on the second page, this time in the fourth paragraph. The company received a commercial boost from the Empress Eugenie of France when she decided the new color flattered her. Very soon, mauve was the necessary shade for all the fashionable ladies in that country. Our answer for 12? France. Last but not least, question 13. According to the passage, which disease is now being targeted by researchers using synthetic dyes? Yet again, the answer is on the second page, this time all the way towards the bottom. Artificial dyes continue to play a crucial role today, and in what would have been particularly pleasing to Perkin, their current use is in the search for a vaccine against malaria. So the answer to number 13, malaria. Thank you for watching. If you found this video helpful, please like share, comment, and subscribe to my channel.